Alright, we're ready to get this party started. Welcome to Kansas Fest 2012. This is the Apple II turned 35 last year. This is the 24th annual Kansas Fest, the eighth one at Rockhurst University. And for the umpteenth year in our row, our attendance is up. So thank you for being a part of that. Anyway. Uh, so this year we're kicking off KFest with a fantastic keynote speech. We have an awesome treat for you guys. Who here loves zombie movies? Um, well, we have none other than George Romero. <laughs> Actually, we couldn't get George, so we got his lesser known brother. <laughs> this year's keynote speech is being given by John Romero, whose Apple II credits include Dangerous Days and Dark Castle. He has been a pillar of the electronic entertainment industry for nearly as long as the Apple II has existed. <coughs> Popular Apple II magazine Insider published his first program in 1984, with many more of his titles to appear in both Insider and Nibble. Romero later joined Origin Systems, publisher of the Ultima and Wing Commander games, as a programmer, after which he co-founded Inside Out Software. At both companies, he ported software to and from the Apple II and Commodore. And here to speak to you more about John Romero is John Romero. Yay. Thanks, Yay. that Lane is here. I didn't know Lane was here. <laughs> Hi, Lane. <laughs> yes, you were, buddy. And uh, actually, Lane and I worked on uh, Dark Castle, and it was for the GS, and actually he did the porting, and I did the art for it. <laughs> and I wrote a lot more than two Apple II games. <laughs> um, let's see if he did something in front of it. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the Apple II in the game industry, since that's kind of where I've lived my whole life. Um, and we'll start with the arcades, which kind of started before, just before the Apple II, but I think they kind of start to coincide at the same time, and kind of with the rise of the Apple II, with the rise of the arcades, the rise of the Apple II kind of happened almost exactly at the same time. Since the two came out in 77, arcades really started to happen around 79, 80. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I lived in the arcades uh, before I got the Apple, and uh, and it was you know there were a lot of really great games there. It was a real uh, amazing creative uh, space back in you know 1980 when you would go to an arcade, and uh, you know every week there are these new new machines coming in, and uh, you know they had to somehow figure out what to cycle out of there, but there was so much creativity happening. Um, that the arcades got bigger and bigger to kind of support all the, the games that were being late released and I played, you know, I lived in the arcade, so I played all of these games um, and I had, a, you know, a paper route and I mowed lawns and I had, you know, like a louse, so mm -hmm. <laughs> all my money went into playing uh, for a while Pac-Man, it was like, you know, hundreds of a month I was playing oh, Pac-Man. Wow. And you know, there's there's a reason why it ate a you know billion quarters. <laughs> um, so, um, from my experience in the arcades and having an Apple II and seeing what's happened uh, since that time, um, I've known the entire time that the Apple II is foundational to the game industry. Um, but you don't really know, I guess until later because the game industry evolves over time and you move from the Apple to the PC or, you know, actually in between there, there's Commodores and there's Amigas and STs, Atari STs and everything, and then it kind of settles down around um, around the PC, but also there's all these consoles and stuff. But when you look back at everything, you can see that really on the Apple II is where most of what we're playing today started. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody knows that you know the excuse for an Apple II is to <laughs> was to use VisiCalc or AppleWorks or um, you know if you if you were into it you would use ProTerm. Um, you know the the mouse card came out so people were playing around with mouse paint and um, anybody know? Well, I guess you can read it there. It's ProCell by Glenn Braden. Um, and uh, and it, there there were a ton of utilities and tools and stuff and you know you can't even write a game really 
efficiently unless you actually have tools like this, like Merlin is the, the program that I use all the time. I think I think Wayne uses well. Everybody here yeah. uses Merlin, are Merlin users. I, I saw the hackathon thing, and it didn't even list Merlin on there. <laughs> Approved <laughs> applications, to, you know, for for writing this code, like where's Merlin sixteen at on the list there. Um, but uh, but I mostly lived in Merlin, and and uh, and I use some of this stuff. But really, um, really for me, the the Apple II was was all about the games on that computer. Um, there were a lot of a lot of there, there were a lot of apps, so I think that there were even more games, um, and uh, so I, you know, here's here's some of the games, very small list here, um, but these are some really great games. Um, is there is there anything that people didn't play on the screen? I think this is pretty, this is pretty universal. Um, you might not tell a Zorro in the bottom left over there. Dino Wake by David Schroeder is What's the one on the bottom super classic. Uh, yeah. Thief by Bob Flanagan. Yeah. And Bob Flanagan went on to um, to make uh, Gauntlet. He worked on Gauntlet. Um, oh. So he kind of went from the Apple II right into arcade since he copied an arcade game. Berserk, he just kind of went straight over there. Uh, Bolo uh, was was probably the first time I'd seen A Star, the A Star algorithm in assembly being used because. Uh, the, all the uh, the enemies follow you perfectly around the maze, and they adapt instantly. So it's doing a, a runtime A star algorithm. Um, and the guy who wrote Bolo uh, never put his name on it because he worked for Microsoft when he wrote the game. <laughs> and so his name was Jim Lane. Uh, kind of outed him later, but um, but yeah, he was he was working for Microsoft, and you know he had to make an Apple II game. So so he did Bolo, and and uh, you know there's Zorro, which was one of the several games. That I think Datasoft was making um, like computer versions of movies and stuff. There was the, the Goonies game, and there was Bruce Lee, and then there was uh, Zorro, and Rick Mursky is the guy who did the ports of those games over to the Commodore, um, which probably explains why there's actually not that. <laughs> which explains why there's a, a lot of full color, full screen color stuff because you didn't really see that too much on the Apple. Um, Karateka is how you say it. <laughs> is that how you say it? <laughs> Most people said Karateka like I had for 20 years until Jordan Mechner told me, no, it's Karateka. Um, <laughs> it just sounds as karate with the K-A after it. Like, um, but uh, did you guys know if you took the Karateka the Karateka disc and you flipped it over that it would just display the whole thing upside down? <laughs> you wouldn't know that if you actually pirated it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, and so Jordan, uh, that was actually his first game that he had published, which was super super lucky to get published um, by Broderbund. And uh, Dino Wake by David Schroeder. He also did Crisis Mountain. If you guys remember that game? It was really cool. Um, years later, when I worked at Softdisk, he uh, submitted he submitted a um, a, uh, a utility thing called Happy Birthday to Me. I think it was called. Um, Using a lot of the same code to do graphical birthday print shop type stuff. I still have the disc that he's that he submitted. <laughs> so it's like it's a rare, one of a kind thing. Um, but Dino Eggs was a really really great game. You had to avoid the big dinosaur mom stomping you because you're going back in time to, to kind of cure everything. You went back and you like put the you know basically introduced the measles to dinosaurs and they're all dying off so you're having to save them. And then. Uh, <laughs> Um, the one on the left there, you know what that one is? Aztec. Aztec. Stairs, yeah, Aztec. Um, and Aztec was a really, it was a really good game. He did, uh, he did that, Paul Stevenson did that after um, Swash Bucket, which right. was oh, the guys, yeah, yeah, another really great game. Side, side, you know, sideways perspective, guys fighting with swords and stuff. Um, and uh, the only thing that kind of was bad about Aztec was, like when they, when you died, you died in the air usually, so the collision detection was kind of crazy. Um, and when I was at Origin in um, in eighty eight, I was there in eighty seven. In an eighty eight, he submitted another game uh, on the Commodore that used the exact same code from nineteen eighty two. <laughs> so I was like, he seriously didn't upgrade his code. So, um, but yeah, I was on the Commodore. So uh, you know, Load Runner 
is a super, super popular game. Um, I'm sure everybody's played World Runner, right? Everybody here is a gamer, right, on the Apple II? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I, I, I can't, I couldn't imagine playing, you know, using Apple Watch for 20 years, so <laughs> I had to do something. Um, uh, Load Runner uh, was originally called Miner. That was a game that Doug Smith wrote, and um, he was he was right. He kind of wrote the game on the mainframe at college, and then he he was he called it Kong because he was kind of copying Donkey Kong, and then moved it to the Apple II, and um, and he uh, he wanted to put a lot of levels in the game, and and he basically had these kids down the street. That, that knew that he was a computer programmer and stuff. So he actually had these kids come over and test Load Runner, and they said that they wanted to make levels. So he made the level editor in Load Runner because the kids wanted to make levels, which then helped to make 150 levels when the game came out. Um, so a lot of them are made by the neighborhood kids. And uh, and one of those neighborhood kids is Darren Stinnett, who is a producer of a lot of LucasArts games. Um, my favorites were Dark Forces, Jedi Knight, um, and uh, Jedi Knight 2 and Outlaws. And so uh, Darren, Darren was the guy who, who uh, was the executive producer on those games and, and came up with the ideas and kind of made the game happen. So, um, so yeah, even just as a neighborhood kid who, who worked on the game and <laughs> made Lumble be, he got into gaming and then really liked it. Um, <clears throat> Ultima 5 was probably my favorite Ultimate of all of them. Um, I played and finished, you know, all the Apple Ultimas, uh, and Five was probably just one of the best Apple II games I think I've played. Um, it's huge. Um, it, uh, it it used 64K. It wasn't trying to use like the extra 64, so it had to. It was so big that it used code overlays. So there's a chunk of memory that they basically wrote commands for different groups of of uh, command. For, they they wrote code for different groups of commands that were kind of similar to each other, so if you would look or inspect or whatever, so that you know, ultimately use the whole keyboard for <laughs> all, the, all the commands. Um, they wrote the code for similar commands in the same code block, and when you use a different command, it would page in the code over the old code, and then run the code in there. So it was so huge, you had to read from this new code block all the time. Um, but it was, you know, it was a really great game. It had kind of two big parts of the game. One was, was when you, uh, Finally killed the uh, the shadow the shadow lords and then uh, and then rescuing Lord British from uh, Dungeon Doom at the bottom. And I was actually at at, uh, at Origin when Ultima Five was being made, and uh, they were making it in Austin, and I was in New Hampshire. And I was in New Hampshire because uh, I was doing a port of twenty four hundred AD. If you guys remember that game, um, and uh, and the Apple the the Apple. Two version of Ultima was being done in Austin, but in uh, in New Hampshire they were kind of simultaneously porting it to the PC. So um, Herman Miller, I'm not sure if you guys know who Herman Miller is. He's a, he was one of the guys up there that that actually uh, stayed at Origin for over 20 years, got the 20 year award and everything. Um, and he was the guy who wrote the the EGA drivers, and uh, and then there were like three other people on the team that that did the game. They converted 602 to C, basically. Um, and the, the guy who was running that uh, project was my was my boss. He was my manager, and so we both left and co founded the company after that. Um, and then Wizardry was uh, a super founding game uh, in the game industry. It was one of the first RPGs, you know, full scale RPGs, um, which came from Dungeons of Despair, which was a game that Rob Woodhead wrote, and he went down to a Boston. Uh, Convention and kind of showed it off and started selling a bunch of these Dungeons of Despair discs, and they immediately created Surtex software right then and started, you know, he upgraded it and called it Wizard for You. Um, anyway, there was, you know, there's there there were so many games on the Apple II, and there's a lot of there's there's a ton of stories behind every single one of these games. Um, but uh, it was these games that brought like extreme vitality to this computer. Um, it it was. You know why I was so excited to play to, to use the Apple II was because of all these amazing games that just kept on coming out, and they were like making variants of stuff that was in the arcade sometimes. Like Cannonball Blitz was really Donkey Kong, but it was a different kind of Donkey Kong, and it was interesting to see what Old Lubeck did with that. Um, 
So in, and also even though the, the Apple II had no graphics or sound hardware, um, you know, compared to the other computers that were out, it, it really thrived because of how open it was and how easy it was to program. Um, you know, to get right in the monitor versus having to download a monitor, you know, on a Commodore or whatever and get in there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> because of all the games coming out, it really made anybody uh, who was making games on here feel like there were just endless possibilities in this computer. You know, just new stuff coming out at one time. It was amazing. Um, <clears throat> so the Apple II, um, it was released months before the, the first real home console. You know, there were there were other, you know, Pong, dedicated Pong machines and stuff, but the first one with cartridges, you know, was the Atari VCS, and the Apple II came out before the VCS did, the same year. Um, it was released two years before the Atari 800, so it had two years on, you know, a, a, a computer that had graphics and sound hardware, um, which really made games way easier to create because then it already does all the graphics and sound. You just kind of give it data, and there it is. Um, <clears throat> four years before the PC came out in August of, of 81, and became like the dominant platform uh, for a long time. And um, and it also, it was released five years before the Commodore. And, and really, it was, back then, it was the Commodore, the Atari, and the Apple. Yeah, the Commodore came out in 82. Um, so you can tell. You know, like the Apple II was there first, and people had years to get good at the Apple II and really start formulating the beginning of the industry. And um, and, the, and it was it was actually a hard a hard computer uh, to program compared to the other ones because you had to write your own code to put stuff on the screen. You didn't have anything out there unless you were going to get a graphics magician or any you know something else that could do some of that stuff for you. You had to write it all yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember um, I didn't want to use other people's code when I wrote my games. I wanted to write my own my own code. And it was interesting to see that when you write your own code, um, it's it's like uh, if you look at the screen as the canvas and the brushes and the stuff that you, you know, the code that you write, um, those other computers, the, the Commodore and the Atari, already had the brushes in them to do sprites and to declare missile graphics and to do the sound. And so you just kind of provided the paint. You know, the brushes were already there, but on the Apple II, you had to do everything. And the canvas was the high-risk screen that was all screwed up. That's really awful, literally. And so the interesting part of that is that when you have to write your own, you have to, you have to write your own brush, you don't usually do it like anybody else does. And when you, when you, and then when you paint with that brush, um, what's on the screen becomes uh, more of, I think, an artistic expression than going through the APIs that, that, that they did on the other machines. So um, after playing games on the Apple II for so long, I could tell just by looking at the screen who wrote the game, because they usually came up with a technique and used that code for successive games that kind of became their signature. So, um, you know, Olaf Lubeck would use, like, XOR all the time. And so I could tell the game from Olaf because of the way that, that he used his XOR routines and kind of the way he laid out his screens. And uh, you could tell Mark Trammell's shapes and his handing out the background and orienting in the shape. Um, and, uh, and so all of these different people, uh, Larry Miller, a really amazing programmer who did Epic and Hadron, um, you know, he, he came up with some amazing 3D routines that kind of flickered and stuff, so you could always tell a game from him. Um, so <clears throat> to me, it was more fun to, I guess, to play or to program on the Apple II because I could write the brush and I could change the brush anytime I wanted to. And, uh, and that made, you know, that made things really interesting um, when you just had a pixel buffer and you had to figure out how to put stuff in there. And uh, as, time, as time went on, um, that the brushes were kind of made for us and you know, even today, the game industry is in is in this. Uh, you know, I guess because games are so complex, they're basically in a situation where there are a ton of APIs that you actually have to use to get to the screen because of the, the vast array of different hardware that's out there. You have to use Direct to, to to get your stuff out. So, um, so we're kind of as game developers, we're pulled, you know, another level back. You know. Between your expression and the screen, and I could yeah I could say nowadays it's it's similar to a Commodore 
or an Atari, but um, but now uh, a lot of games use engines that pulls you back one more level because now you didn't write the engine, and so you kind of have to use the engine the way it's written and go along with that, which means you know you have to work a little harder to make your game not look like all the other games that use the same engine. So um, to me, the Apple II was just really the pure computer that that let us express everything that we could on it. Um, and uh, there were a bunch of there were a bunch of uh, tricks that, that we had to use on the Apple II uh, to make games go fast, like unwound loops, precompiled shapes, um, stuff like that. It was you know you had to eat up a lot of memory to make things go faster. Um, but I think it was I think it made better programmers out of everybody that started out on the Apple II. Um, let's see, I think we're going to talk about some of the pioneers in the industry. Um, Dan Gorlin, you guys all remember Choplifter, super awesome game. Um, Choplifter came out before Loadrunner, so those are Loadrunner, you know, those are Choplifter shapes in Loadrunner. <laughs> he, actually, he actually took them. Um, yeah, he totally took the same shapes. He, you know, it was like, hey, this is the world of Rotorbun games, and they want to get stuff out quick, so it's like, hey, why not do that? Um, in yeah, at Series Software, they kind of had a similar situation where uh, Nasser Jabelli had written Easy Draw, and they used the fonts and stuff in every uh, Serious game. Um, Dan Gorlin, after he after he created Choplifter, um, he wrote Airheart, which was a pretty cool uh, double high res game. It was kind of abstract and, and everything, and it was really cool. But a lot of people were like, "What?" It's kind of weird. And, and he made a game called Typhoon Thompson, which was made after the same original character. And uh, he made a lot of <laughs> he made a lot of he made he made good money off of uh, a choplifter so much that he he tried to figure out you know a way of um, a way of making games cross platform a lot easier than okay now we got to write this whole thing on whatever so um, so what he did was he used uh, Sun Microsystems machines and uh, Unix OS that's on there and he wrote uh, create he dumped a ton of money into this he created custom SCSI cables that would go from the Sun Microsystems to Atari STs and Amigas and everything and basically cross developed uh, the games on the, the Sun systems and then downloaded them into the target machine, which then he, you know, he, had, he had code to, to pull the data down, but he was writing it in, a, in an environment that he created that would run on all the other systems. And um, I think he did that in 86. And so that was pretty advanced back then. Um, and he, he spent a lot of money on it and it didn't really go anywhere, but it was a pretty cool thing that, that uh, some other people have done. We did that in software where we were using next step systems to make Doom and Quake and Heretic and Hexen and basically writing the entire game on next step and just downloading it to DOS. Basically copying next step to the world. Um, so Dan Bunton uh, was a really great pioneer um, that started on the Apple II with Speakeasy software in 1978, wrote Wheeler Dealers. And Wheeler Dealers was um, you know, the way that Mule worked with the auctioning and stuff, uh, Wheel of Dealers was kind of boiled down to the auctioning. And it came with a little hardware, a little piece of hardware that would plug into the 16 pin port in the Apple II and have four players simultaneously bidding on the auctions uh, at the same time playing on the Apple II. So it was like the first multiplayer at the same time game back then. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Mule was, was an amazing game. Uh, he, because he had to sell the hardware on the Apple II, that was kind of like not not optimal to, to make multiplayer games to sell hardware with it because it was more expensive. So he migrated over to the Atari, and that's why he all had this, you know, like the Atari has four plugs just for joysticks, and so he kind of went over to the hardware that had all the plugs on it instead of having to sell some. Um, but Dan was super influential in all multiplayer games because a lot of his stuff for Modem Wars, you know, etc. was was all multiplayer and, and very influential to the game industry, the game designers. Jim Nichols, um, you guys remember Bug Attack and Microwave and Starfleet? Yeah, 
Yeah, Jim was Jim was so awesome. He was he was probably the guy that that made the Apple you know sing better than anybody else. He was a real he really focused on on audio. So he did like electric duet. He had you know he had uh, he had he could do multi tone voice, but in addition to doing that, he also made a whole game run at the same time. So if you guys have played if you haven't played Microwave, it's like one of the few games that has basically like the Star Wars Cantina theme playing while you're playing the game. And it's not easy to do that on an Apple II. Um, and Bug Attack was, you know, it had a, it had a song playing at the at the same time while you were while you were playing the game. I think it came out before um, yeah it did. It came out it came out a year before Microwave. Um, but uh, but Cavalier Computer was his, his little company and um, he uh, I had a, a an Apple II reunion party in 1998, and uh, and Jim Mitchell was going to be coming to that, but he died like two months before the party, so that was super super unfortunate. And his wife um, sent me a really nice framed um, advertisement for Cavalier Computer back when they were in the in all the magazines and stuff. But yeah, unfortunately, he's not around. And actually, he was um, in the late uh, 90s. Uh, before he passed away, he was basically like one of the first anti-spam proponents, and he was, he was getting really big about uh, anti-spam stuff before there was any anti-spam software that he saw that was starting starting to happen. Um, so, uh, get some more here, so. Right. Mark Trammell. Uh, Mark Trammell is was a an amazing pioneer. Started out, you know, with sneakers. Um, at Sirius, with and one of the few games that have just huge shapes on the screen, um, and uh, and then Beer Run, which was his his you know Donkey Kong kind of game, but was more complex and, and interesting. Um, and he kind of moved. He, he kind of hopped from from machine to machine. He went on to the twenty six hundred and did like Fast Eddie and some other stuff for Atari, and then he. Uh, went into the arcades. He went to work for Midway, which he stayed at for 20 years, and he did NBA Jam and WrestleMania, uh, Total Carnage, Ballers, a um, whole bunch of games until basically when Midway went down, he left Midway. So he was there for 20 years, and now he's making Facebook games. And uh, there's a company called Zynga. You all heard of Zynga? <laughs> so Zynga makes you know Farmville, a bunch of other stuff. Um, the Zynga Zynga is a huge company that IPO'd for I think a billion or, or more than one billion, and um, and so they've been trying to hire up all the game designers in the industry, uh, especially the ones that are well known. So uh, so Mark went over there and he basically got to establish his own San Diego studio, and uh, and other you know like Lewis Castle started Westwood Studios. If you guys remember Westwood, and he started a Las Vegas studio. And then he didn't like the 24/7 CEO phone calls and texts and stuff, so he just left Zynga. He's just like, you get this too old for this one. <laughs> but there's a lot of there's a lot of um, of uh, several Apple II and game industry pioneers that have moved over to Zynga. And Mark is one of them. And uh, I met with him just a few weeks ago in San Diego, uh, just to find out about his you know his uh, experience at Zynga because we work with Zynga on a company right now, um, just to kind of trade stories. Um, but he's, you know, he's he's uh, one of the few long timers, I guess, uh, in the industry. There's not a lot of people that started out making games in 1980, 81 that are still making games today, 30 years later. Um, but Mark has has been doing it, you know, the entire time. Dan Gorland stopped, and, and uh, I guess that, that picture of Dan Gorland's from his uh, African drumming troop dance troop thing. So he's been doing African drumming stuff for decades. So he, he loves it. Um, let's see, the, uh, of course, people know who Bill Budge is. Um, Bill Budge is, you know, super awesome guy. Uh, you know, he did Penny Arcade, which was, you know, his, his introduction to the Apple II and his, his, I guess, hook in the programming was, um, he played a little brick out on the master disc and, uh, he wanted to make the, you know, like a machine language version of it. So he, he basically figured out the high-res screen mappings, and and uh, you know, one night he finally got the pong ball bouncing around. It was just like Eureka moment for him, and it was, that was it for him. 
he had to he had to learn everything about graphics, and so he kind of became a graphics guru, and um, and you can tell he you know he wrote Raster Blaster, which was the first great pinball game, um, and then he made a toy out of it with the pinball construction set, which pretty much cemented him for all time. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have um, a copy, one of his last copies of that that he signed and sent to me back in the 90s of the original Budge Co. version before EA took it and repackaged it and sold it. Um, and it's funny, the uh, there's an address on there. Yeah, right down there under Budge Co. is his address, uh, and he still lives there today. <laughs> I still have that house. I've been to his house before, too, with my friend Tom. Um, and he was working at Sony for years, uh, just down the road from me, you know, Silicon Valley area in Foster City. And uh, just recently, maybe a couple of years ago, he moved to Google um, to, I guess, be, get more stability. He's he wasn't really a games guy. He's really a programmer, um, and uh, and he liked writing tools. And what he was writing was like graphic tools to let people do fun stuff. And um, and so he, you know, after after selling uh, pinball construction sets to EA, he basically went to Maui and just windsurfed for years <laughs> before coming back and deciding, you know, he doesn't want to make games, he wants to make tools, and kind of settled on that. Um, and so he's at Google now, and when he was moving from Sony over to Google, he, uh, you know, we, we talk and have lunch and stuff every once in a while, so he basically gave me all of his books that he had at Sony, which are all Windows programming books. C sharp and everything, but I have all of Bill Budge's books on a bookshelf at the company. I put the Bill Budge's books. On. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, he's 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 a super super nice guy. Like all of these people are really really great people. Um, he uh, not sure if you knew this, but Penny Arcade when he, he got that little pong ball moving around, mm -hmm. made an actual pong game from it called called the thing Penny Arcade, and uh, and he gave it to Apple. You guys know about that? He just like gave Penny Arcade to Apple and put on a tape that he traded for some Tronics printer. That's all he wanted. <laughs> That's all he wanted. Like, <laughs> yeah, he just wanted a printer, so he just traded this game on cassette that sank pretty valuable now. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then my favorite of all time is Nasser Jabelli, who was uh, just an unbelievable programmer who cranked out so much stuff on the Apple II. Um, you know, his, his, I guess, a uh, fateful meeting with Jerry Jewell at the computer land that Jerry was manager of, you know, uh, Jerry saw that this guy came in and he just kept on writing lots and lots of stuff and basically started Siri software. And, uh, and Nasser was only serious for a couple of years, or two, two to three, two and a half years. But he wrote a ton of games uh, back then. And, and uh, if you guys remember Autobahn, of course, Gorgon, Space Eggs, Phantom's Five. One of his earlier games was called Both Barrels, which is like a Western shoot-up kind of thing. Um, Space Cruiser, or Star Cruiser, which is a uh, like a you know, space you know, space invaders type game. Um, and uh, and he basically created that easy draw system that all the games use. Um, with the fonts, the big colorful fonts that you can see at the top of the screen there. He did a game called Free Fall. Um, wrote a lot of games. Pulsar 2, mm -hmm. Cyber Strike. Mm -hmm. Cyber Strike was another complex game. <laughs> Used all the keys on the keyboard. And my friend uh, Tom Hall actually made a block of wood that had that, that went over his keyboard on the Apple II and had all the stuff written on <laughs> it. So you could just overlay it, which is, you know, was, I guess the way that the Apple mechanic had the little folding thing that went behind your top row of keys. Um, so he basically uh, got that signed by Nasser as well, and we had a big party. But Nasser actually came to the party. That's why there, that, there's a picture of Nasser there. It's the only other picture you'll find of him is from 1981, the Soft Time magazine. And uh, I have those those pictures too. But actually, uh, when he came to the party, um, you know, I had like probably 40 different people, uh, four, 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 40 awesome game programmers and industry people there, and uh, and Waz was there as well. And this was in Dallas in 1998, and um, you know you would think that everybody wanted to meet Moaz, but they all wanted to meet Nasser because <laughs> he was an enigmatic, mysterious programmer that everybody knew, but nobody actually met except Bill Budge because they were friends. Um, Doug Carlson and uh, and 
NASA or, or and Bill Budge was the only two people from the industry that NASA ever really met with or, or knew. So he was this guy that made a ton of games, huge impact on everybody after him, just like Bill Budge, and uh, nobody got to meet him. So that party was pretty amazing, and um, and uh, and I have six hours of videotaped uh, interviews of that whole party that I'm working with Jason Scott to get all that stuff off and uh, and kind of do something cool with it. But I have a, a really good uh, interview with Nasser. Um, and uh, and Nasser, uh, as, as far as I know, after um, he after Sirius, he basically started Jabelli Software. And so, yeah, Firebird and um, Rusky Duck and uh, let's see what other games did they work on. Um, he got into 3D with the Zenith and Horizon 5, so he kind of was experimenting with that perspective. Um, and uh, and so he wrote, he, he started in 82 at Jabelli, but didn't last long, lasted like a year or so because the video game crash happened. Thanks to the Atari VCS, it kind of killed a ton of um, companies back then. So it killed, basically killed uh, Jabelli software, but it basically said that he made more money at Jabelli than the whole time at Sirius. <laughs> So, um, so he was able to uh, basically kind of take take time off and travel the world. Had a bunch of money. Crash happened. He didn't know what he was going to do after that. Like maybe the whole game industry collapsed. And so he spent um, probably two to three years traveling. And uh, and when he came back, he decided that he still wanted to make games. And uh, he went to Doug Carlson, who created uh, Rotorbook. He's the guy behind Rotorbook. And so he came back to Doug and just said, hey, so what's like, what is there to do now in gaming after what happened? And Doug said that like, the game industry has been saved by this company called Nintendo in Japan. And, <laughs> and that's what's happening right now. The Apple II is still going, and this is like in 1986. Um, he said the Apple II is still kind of going along, but really it's, it's all about these new consoles coming in. Because Doug was like heavily invested in, in that and uh, doing a lot of uh, working with a company called Star StarCraft that was over there in Japan and was importing a lot of games. And they were importing U.S. games from Roadrunner. And so um, he basically said, uh, you got to be on the Nintendo and start programming games on the Nintendo. So he introduced Nasser to um, the Squaresoft, or Square. Uh, in, when they came to San Francisco, uh, Nasser met with the Square people, and they all knew who he was. He was just this legendary guy that, that you know, had written tons of stuff and everybody knew. So um, they basically wanted to hire him. So he, Nasser was like, okay, I got to be on this platform. I might as well do this. So he moved to Japan. Nasser goes and moves to Japan to work for Square. And um, he was the only programmer that they had there. He basically came in and two programmers quit. They, 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 they were leaving at the same time because the company was like on the road. Um, but what he did was he wrote Final Fantasy. And uh, so Jabelli wow. saved uh, Square and started the whole Final Fantasy series RPGs, basically after Wizardry, of course. But Wizardry went over to Japan and inspired everyone in Japan to make RPGs. So kind of started in the U.S., went over to Japan, and then kind of came back. Um, but yeah, so so Nasser created um, he created uh, Final Fantasy one and two and three. So he programmed all three of those in Japan. The only ones that, that people in the U.S. see is really one and four and six. Um, but uh, the, he did all those there. And uh, in fact, Final Fantasy II was, um, while he was making Final Fantasy II for Square over there, uh, there was a problem with his visa that had run out and didn't get renewed, and he had to come back to the United States. So Square flew the whole development team to Sacramento, and they finished <laughs> Final Fantasy II in Sacramento. Oh, wow. <laughs> And then they got it back over, you know, to get released and stuff. But um, after that, the after Final Fantasy three, uh, NASA wrote Secret of Mana. You guys have heard of Secret of Mana? That came out in nineteen ninety three, and that was another big, big game on uh, the Super Nintendo. And um, and that was basically the last uh, the last game that he programmed. He kind of after nineteen ninety three, he's done programming games, and he made crazy millions of dollars off of um, his Final Fantasy stuff. So he just retired. Completely with at least ten million, um, and so when he came to the Apple II party, you know he he was not only the most successful guy other than Waz, but you know but he'd also like set, I guess set in, you know not only did he 
uh, plant seeds at the very beginning when he created his amazing games of series, but then he did it for the future with, with everything he did at Squaresoft. Um, yeah, he did it twice, which is really, really rough. Um, he, uh, he did other games like Rad Racer, 3D World Runner, and stuff before he did Final Fantasy as kind of a warm up, and then Final Fantasy was his big thing, and he was the only coder on it. And, uh, you know, and it was great when I saw Secret of Mana. I had no idea that he, that he had written it, and, uh, and I you know, knew it was a big title, and I put it in my, my uh, Super Nintendo. And as soon as, you know, the, the, the game started, I wish I'd put video on here because it would be a little more interesting. Um, but there were like these pink birds flying across the screen with really great music, and it just goes, you know, by, you know, written by NASA. Like, no way. <laughs> I was just blown away. It had been like 10 years since I'd seen that name before. Um, so it was really amazing, and, um, and it was great to meet him in 1998, which was like five years after. Um, I kind of tracked him down, and I right now know exactly where he lives. I know his phone number. <laughs> he's, in, he's in Sacramento, um, and uh, plan on going to visit him and do another long video event um, so, uh, so anyway, yeah, so he, he's, he's retired, like many of the other people, but Mark Trammell is, is not. Um, so, you know, the game industry of Apple II really forced the future, even if you count Nasser as an Apple II guy, he started on the Apple, then he kind of created the next wave on the, on the Nintendo. Um, a lot of Apple II pioneers started companies that um, kind of forged new technology in, in games for the future, such as John Garcia, who, who did Zaxxon for the Apple II. Um, he started a company called Nova Logic, which created the voxel engines that everybody saw in uh, you know a whole bunch of games. And, and then there's there's you know the uh, the games that he did like Delta Force after that Nova Logic, which are like massive multiplayer games like Battlefield, etc. So he that kind of started back then. Um, if everybody remembers uh, Raid Over Moscow by Bruce Carver, um, that was a, a pretty cool game on the Apple II. And Bruce started a company called Access Software, which then did the whole Lynx 386 Pro and the whole golfing thing, which then turned into Golden Tee. And, you know, that's a huge, huge, that's probably the number one money making arcade game in existence right now. Um, and uh, that was kind of started from an Apple II guy who didn't know anything about stuff and then made it, made it big. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, you know, people that started on the Apple II that kind of went forward and then spawned a lot of stuff that went at that point, whether it was a new invention or it was just refining the stuff that they had done before. Um, let's see. Let's look at the games that were spawned. Um, Wizardry came out in 1980. Uh, it was written by Pascal, which is UCSD Pascal that Mark and Alex had written, um, who had done Test Patrol, some other games. He was working uh, at I believe it was Berkeley, and he wrote the uh, UCSD Pascal, and then Wizardry was able to be made into a property with him because of my face so much. He didn't want to do assembly. So Wizardry was created, but then it, it created all basically RPGs. Uh, came from Wizardry, graphical RPGs. And um, Final, Fantasy, you know, Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, EverQuest, World of Warcraft, these all came from the origin of Wizardry. Um, and the industry is huge. World of Warcraft is over a billion dollars a year that the company makes off just that game. Um, and uh, EverQuest is still running. You know, even Ultima Online, that started in '97, is still running as an MMO. Um, and uh, and that was started from Ultima. So <laughs> there's there's uh, the, the future of RPGs is really um, people copying WoW and trying to get past WoW to do something better than WoW, which is really really hard to do. Um, but you know, Wizardry still lives on in that game. Um, Beneath Apple Manor, not sure if many of you guys played it, um, but that was a really early game that Don Worth wrote, who did, you know, Inside Apple DOS, Inside Apple Pro DOS, and, um, and, and he, he created uh, Beneath Apple Manor, which was the first roguelike game, but it came out two years before Rogue did. <laughs> so they call it a roguelike, because Rogue was more popular but it came out two years before Rogue. And actually, when they were writing Rogue, they didn't, they didn't know about Beneath Apple Manor because they were writing on, on a university machine and, and you know, Beneath Apple Manor was on the Apple II. So they didn't know that they were copying somebody else's stuff already. 
at the same time, um, there was a, a guy named Stuart Smith who wrote, wrote a game called Fracas that was in low res on the Apple II. It had eight players that could play in it. Probably that's a really obscure game on the Apple II. Um, but he wrote the Adventure Construction set, mm -hmm. Alibaba, and then 40 Thieves, if you remember that. Um, so he, he wrote those games based off of Fracas, which is based off of the Apple II. Um, and then that's you know that's basically rogue at the top, but then there's spelunky on the left hand side, which which embodies the same randomly generated levels to basically adventure through and kill stuff and get past obstacles. And then Minecraft is really the ultimate embodiment of, of the new Apple Manor. And um, I'm not sure if you, if you guys anyone plays Minecraft here. If you haven't, this is probably one of the best games that's ever been made. And it might not look like it, but um, it's uh, it's one of the, it's one of the most creative games that you can play. Basically, when you get into this game, you can just walk around and uh, and just destroy a block at a time and build with that block if you want. So you can like hit a hit, hit piece of a tree, a little piece of tree comes out, and then you can use that tree to create a lot of planks. You know, like multiply it out. So you can take those planks and it multiplies out to sticks, and then you use sticks to build pickaxes, and shovels, axes, swords, and all that stuff. Um, bows and arrows, and all kinds of you know like machines that, that do stuff. Uh, people build computers in this world um, because there's basically like electronic line wire that you can kind of put down, but you have to mine it out of the world. You mine the redstone out, and it becomes wire that you then switch with the torch, and it basically creates a circuit, and then and then uh, you know, people created ALEs in here. Um, but it's really a, an awesome game uh, with a randomly generated world that is infinite. So if you go anywhere north near, like where the back plane will stop drawing, they'll just generate more. And it's just like, how big is your hard drive? And, um, and it's a multiplayer game, so you can have the whole family in there. And uh, I play with you know seven-year-old kids. I'm playing in there with, with my fiance. And we're in our 40s, and it is like the most fun thing ever, where everybody is building castles together, and mining, you know, iron and gold, and you know, all kinds of cool stuff. Diamonds are like the big thing to find in this game, um, and there's lots of scary dungeons full of monsters, and it gets dark, it's a bad time out there, and you can like put torches down all over the place, and here come creepers and zombies and all kinds of stuff. And so everybody's fighting for their life, or they just wall themselves in and keep building and mining while that perimeter is defended. Um, and uh, and it just the day night cycles and everything. It's a, it's an amazing game, um, and it was written by one guy, um, which still shows like yeah, of course one person can still change the world or do really great things. This game has definitely influenced many years from now uh, what games are going to be like. This was a huge influential game. Um, he's, uh, he, uh, he's in Sweden, uh, his name's Notch, uh, Marcus Person, and, uh, he wrote this game by himself, and he kind of did his own, like, Kickstarter thing, where he was going to start making this game, and so he made a web page about it, and told people, hey, so if you want to donate, you know, I can keep on working on it, it's going to be pretty cool, and people started to register it and donate, and, um, he was charging $21 for people to play multiplayer or free single player. You could just play in a web browser, it's written in Java. Um, and, uh, and he basically uh, got it, you know, I played on the, on the Mac all the time. And uh, he got, uh, he's raised the price up to 27 bucks now, but he's got over 6 million registrations. So he's made over $100 million just himself. So he's kept his little company, you know, very small, like 10 people working on something new uh, and, and different, but, uh, but he just, you know, he did it. He's the most successful indie in existence, and it's because that game is unbelievable. So if you guys haven't played it, download Minecraft and, and uh, you know, run a multiplayer server, get the family in there, and it's just like the, the most fun thing ever. Um, but yeah, that's, that's from Beneath Apple Manor, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. You play Apple Manor and it can turn into something like Minecraft, which is still going through randomly generated dungeons, killing monsters. Um, there's even giant bosses and all kinds of stuff underground. So it's, it's crazy. It's a crazy game. It's so weird. Um, Castle Wolfenstein, uh, Silas Warner's, you know, masterpiece, pretty much. 
I was here uh, with Lane in 1992, and we had just finished making Wolfenstein 3D, which is you know, really crazy to get that on top. And um, and so uh, we basically finished it in 1992. We had a first color laptop that Toshiba had made, so it was the first one in existence. We bought it. We put. Uh, Wolfenstein 3D on it. We brought it to Kansas now. Oh, what a god! <laughs> it's five thousand bucks. And so um, we brought it to Kansas Fest and showed everybody. And we had no idea, but Silas Warner was peanutting it. That was the <laughs> craziest oh, wow. coincidence ever. And so uh, we brought our manuals with us to show people. And it's like, uh, sign it, please. So, <laughs> so we had sign, Silas sign the manual. Um, and uh, and we, if you guys know who Bill Heinemann is. Yeah. So it's Becky, Becky yeah. um, lives in LA now, but uh, but Bill was there, and uh, and we basically like hung out in the hallway with Silas for hours, just talking about news and all kinds of stuff. And he actually gave a talk. I think you guys have archived on the whole new software thing, um, like how that happened, how how he wrote the, you know the, the little languages that he used, the, the macro languages he used to make make his other stuff. Um, and uh, and so Castle Wolfenstein, when you look at what the original game was, um, it was it was like a stealth game. It was like one of the first stealth games. You're trying not to get caught. You're trying to you know um, get through the castle, trying to avoid the SS, um, and be as quiet as you can because when you shoot, here comes somebody in the room following you and all that stuff. So it was um, kind of like the first stealth game, which then you know, basically created series like Splinter Cell and the Hitman series and other games that that try and, and uh, get the player through the worlds in a real stealth way. The Hitman series um, on the right, on the, on the left, Splinter Cell does it in a way where you're really trying to be secretive. You're, you're going up walls and going across roofs and ceilings and stuff, and it's really, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the way that you would expect a crazy, you know, uh, I guess parkour <laughs> spy <laughs> agent to get through stuff, but Hitman's totally opposite that. Where um, Hitman is is about being stealthy in open in an open space with everybody around you. And the latest one is coming out that they were just showing at E3, and that one um, has you in huge, huge crowds having to to complete missions like you know. Uh, take someone for a hostage or kill somebody or whatever. And it's like with tons and tons of people. And, and it's all about disguise and uh, not, you know, staying away from the guys that are trying to get you, whether it's bad guys or the police or whatever. And so um, uh, in on the screen in the Hitman series, they have these, these attention meters that kind of are going like this. And then they, when someone is coming towards you that's probably going to detect you, it starts to get, do this kind of animation on the screen. And you need to basically turn your head away from them and kind of try and walk away. And they, they're, and everybody's heads are turning towards you and looking and stuff. And so you're trying to, like, not, not, you know, be visible. And so the attention thing goes down, and you turn and kind of walk towards something else and do something that, that that's not grabbing someone's attention. And uh, and that's a pretty unique thing for any game to do, where it's every character's using line of sight to look at you and figure out what's the probability that I'm going to bust this guy and how close they're going to get to you and what you're going to try and do about it. And, you know, it's really, really interesting. As an example, you know, one mission is you're on the back, you're, you're in a cargo plane in in the North Pole, you know, with the back open and there's all kinds of some secret base going on and you, you're, you're back there looking, you know, like in a business suit, which should be worn when you're <laughs> in the Arctic. And, uh, and you, there's a general who's eating in a building somewhere, and you have to go kill him somehow and not be a detective. And so you have to, like, get the guy that's in the cargo plane and take his jacket and everything and put that on and go inside the building where the guy's eating. You have to go in the kitchen and poison the food that he's drinking that makes him go to the bathroom. So you're waiting in the bathroom for him when he's eventually coming in there so then you can kill him and take his, his uniform and go out and do the things that he would be doing and make different decisions and ruin the stuff that they're doing and all kinds of crazy stuff. But, uh, you know, all the complexity of, of these type of stealth games came from Castle Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein, which actually was a pretty complex game to play because you had to have like eight, eight keys on 
movement and aiming and firing. Um, and one thing I don't know if you guys knew about Wolfenstein, uh, the path through the castle is the same every single time. So basically he's randomly generating while you're reading the, the text, it's randomly generating all the interior walls of the rooms. So to make sure that the cutouts, yeah, the map, the map is always the same getting through Wolfenstein. It's just the interior walls look different, so you feel like it's random. Right <laughs> yeah, beyond, I don't think that they did it. Um, but we were super influenced by Castle Wolfenstein, which is the reason why we made Wolfenstein 3D. And, uh, and that was in 92, and then I believe in the year 2001, um, that's when uh, Return to Wolfenstein came out. And then in 2010, Wolfenstein, they just call it Wolfenstein, that came out. And so I think it's one of the longest running series in gaming since 81, until um, 2010, and we're still planning on making more. So it definitely is you know, still going. Lots of games have, have been inspired by Wolfenstein. Of course, if you say, here's the beginning of, of high-speed FPS first-person shooter games, it was Wolfenstein 3D and everything that came after that. Um, but I'm just, just kind of focusing on the stealth aspect, not just all 3D games in general. Um, so the Bilestone, if you guys remember that, um, the Bilestone was a pretty bloody game, uh, you know, flying on these discs and cutting people's arms off with axes, and, you know, it was really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that blood inspired games like Mortal Kombat, uh, and, and really the person-on-person -person combat aspect of it, even though it was kind of abstract and it wasn't side to side the way that Swashbuckler was, it still um, kind of inspired the fighting genre of a one on one kind of situation. And Karate Champ came out in 1984, but Bilestone came out in 82. Um, because it was so bloody, because Bilestone was so bloody, um, Mark Goodman, who programmed the game, did not want his name on it. And so he <laughs> called himself Mangrove Earth Shoe. And that was the name that was on the, on the title screen of the game. Um, but he basically got out of games right after it, right after the milestone, he just totally was done. But he, he had programmed a lot of really great stuff before that. Um, he just decided to, to just stop. And, um, uh, who actually created a version of that for the Macintosh. Yeah. That yeah, you know, I remember reading about I that. I still have, but I could not find a publisher who would take it. 360 it wasn't around anymore. They didn't understand it. Yeah, it was just abstract and crazy. It was, yeah, abstract <laughs> and crazy, and I was really disappointed that nobody was not a publisher that could understand how great it was and distributed. Yeah, it's like, hey, here's a classic game from 1982. What? You know, don't care. And, you know, like games back in 1982 or 81, it was crazy and abstract, and that's what everybody ate up. And, you know, um, but nowadays it's genreification. You know, it's all about like this, what genre does this fit in? So maybe we could publish it if it fits there. And Bilestone is so different, um, but it did inspire a lot of a lot of uh, fighting games. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, Oregon Trail, <laughs> of course, was a super influential game for ed uh, like edutainment or, or educational games for kids. Um, not sure if you guys have played the iPhone version of Oregon Trail that came out, but it was unbelievable the work that they put into the game loft as a company that did it. It is just the best, the best version of, of Oregon Trail that could ever be made. Um, it takes a great amount, a, a good amount of time to get across the United States. Um, lots of crazy stuff happens along the way. It's always fun. I've laughed out loud playing the game. It's so crazy. Um, and it makes it even more fun than the Apple II version. But the Apple II version was super influential in um, you know, teaching kids about, about how hard it is to do that stuff and, and how to balance and buy stuff. And, um, and so you know, we kind of got Where in the World is Carmen San Diego coming from that. Um, and uh, Math Blaster and everything else. You know, like here's this game. Hey, you can teach kids on the computer. Lemonade stand, some of that stuff. Um, and then it really turned into a lot of a lot of educational stuff. That's basically Pajama Sam and Putt Putt, and those were uh, humongous, humongous games uh, that Ron Gilbert had made. Uh, the guys made Secret of Monkey Island and Maniac Mansion and stuff. Went on and did kids' edu educational stuff. Um, but a lot of it, you know, it was it was Oregon Trail that that blazed 
to that trail when it was for educational stuff. Um, not sure if you guys remember Sundog. A Sundog Frozen Legacy was like an over the world game that was very different than, than other games on the Apple II and inspired uh, GTA and Saints Row the Third and uh, you know any of the open world games that uh, that are out now. This is Watch Dogs on the bottom right. It's the latest and greatest of the GTA style games that was just announced at E3. And um, and it's and it's crazy to think about the design of a game like Watch Dogs. And you you know the other two are pretty complex open world games, but Watch Dogs is way more complex than that. And that it started from a simple Apple II open world game that gave you the same feeling, but with limited you know limited agency. Um, Watch Dogs has uh, basically it's like hey we're all using iPhones we've got Wi-Fi everywhere why aren't we using that to basically get through the world and so the guy has got super spy equipment off of his phone and he's able to turn on and off you know um, like send out like EMPs that disrupt that disrupt signal and make people do things and give them, you know, switch switch the lights uh, at intersections to make cars crash if someone's in a car that he needs to crash they can go and Make sure the guy's dead or we'll rescue him or whatever. All kinds of crazy stuff, but you're using technology in the game. It's a full GTA game, but you're using tons of technology as a layer over everything that exists in the world. And so um, everybody at E3 was very excited about it. Um, but it's, you know, the latest, it's the latest in the Sundog legacy, I guess. Um, Wasteland was a really great game. That Alan Tablish made with EA, I believe it was '85, and inspired, um, you know, inspired a ton of post-apocalyptic games. It was like the first real post-apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic adventure. And um, Left for Dead is an example of that, it's like an FPS, but it's kind of post-apocalyptic, zombie-ish. Um, Gears of War, even post-apocalyptic game, and um, and this is Fallout 3, which is a direct descendant of Wasteland. Um, so, um, even that whole genre really started on the Apple and influenced the RPG aspects of all of the games that came after it in that, in that setting. Um, so, my, my entire career has been defined by the Apple because that's where I started. And, um, and I've played so many games on the Apple II and everything, you know, basically that was on other systems that came after it, I could see. How games had started on the Apple II, where they where they got to where they're at now, and what they were like then, um, and uh, and it's always interesting to design games knowing like oh well, this was actually a really great thing in Robot Odyssey that you know <laughs> I can actually use for this you know and just know the designs of, of everything, um, but I always go back to the Apple II just because there are so many unique things about the Apple II that people like forgot and didn't and didn't bring forward. Uh, because there's like little nuances in some of those old games that, that when they, they make the you know, sequels or inspired um, clones, they don't bring some of the important things with them. And some of those important things actually are super applicable to, to making games today. Um, so I always uh, I always think back about you know Apple II games and like what did they what did they do? Um, how did they make their decisions when they were doing stuff? Um, what kind of tricks can we do for them that might be useful today? Um, when, when, um, um, so making Wolfenstein, uh, before Wolfenstein was, you know, the Commander Keen series, the kind of the start of his software, and, um, and making Wolfenstein, that was like directly inspired by the Apple II. Um, we were trying to figure out like what game should we make, you know, right after we had made uh, a 3D game called Cat Film 3D in you know, 16 color EGA graphics. We we're like, okay, well, we're gonna do an EGA game. What should we do? And there was like an idea of, you know, there's how about a mutant uh, lab that goes crazy and you have to rescue the scientists and stuff. And we're like, boring, don't care, you know, heard seen that in so many movies. Um, and so I just said, hey, what about Wolfenstein? Why don't we just redo that? That would be amazing. There's, there's not you know that people may have forgotten that amazing game, and we could do a really great 3D version of it. And so we um, immediately the, the, there was only four of us that did it at the time.
time, one of one of the four people was an artist who was never a gamer at all. He just did really great art. And then the other three of us were all Apple II assembly language programmers for a long time. And so we all got it immediately. It's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> we didn't even have to try and come up with another idea. It was like, totally great idea. Let's do that. So um, we didn't know what we were going to call it because we're like, well, Muse owns the copyright and all that stuff. So we'll just make Wolfenstein and we'll figure out what we can call it later. And uh, and later, when we got our biz guy, which was you know only a few months after we started making the game, biz guy, uh, Jay Wilbur, goes and basically finds out that all of Muse's assets were sold to a woman in Baltimore, and she just keeps the rights, I guess. And so he basically just bought them. I'm just like, uh, yeah, how about we? <laughs> we would like that, you know, that 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 one trademark right there. So we bought the the Wolfenstein trademark, um, and so its software owned it, and then we could call it Wolfenstein. But before that point, we created um, a whole bunch of names that just were not as cool as Wolfenstein. <laughs> so, so, um, so anyway, we, it was great because we got to stay true to the original name. Uh, we actually got rid of some of the things in the game that slowed it down, like you know. Uh, Investigating dead bodies and getting stuff out of it, or having crates that you wait 20 seconds or shoot the lock to, to make it go faster. Those things stop the crazy action of the game, and, and the action is what was defining, you know, that speed was defining the new way of playing these kinds of games. And so I think putting those other, leaving those other parts in there would have detracted from what the game was all about and kind of showing, like, this is what shooters are about. This thing, you know, thinking, the speed. You think you already passed? Uh, oh maybe yeah <laughs> it could have been yeah it could have been inspired but it was there was an earlier movie right that was a remake oh. <laughs> they killed. yeah that's right <laughs> kill, yeah we didn't do beyond castle Wolfenstein, but we kind of put them both into one because you do get to kill hitler in, in episode three are you going to celebrate that on july 20th huh are you going to celebrate that on july yeah 20th? maybe <laughs> <laughs> july 20th you get yeah. killed um yeah we uh we put both kind of the whole thing in there because we didn't know if we were going to make sequels or whatever, I guess, to that specific game. Um, but uh, but it was really, I mean, it was pretty it was pretty cool making the game. It only took us six months. So we started the game, probably took a month and a half until the 3D engine was done, and then we spent the rest of the time building, the, you know, doing the graphics, building the levels, death cam, you know, all the stuff that we put in there, um, and, uh, and then got the game out. We actually uploaded it uh, before it was actually finished. We, we uploaded a shareware version because the, the publisher was so crazy about the game, couldn't believe, like, it's gotta, we gotta get this thing out there, that, um, that we basically uploaded it, and then we finished the other two episodes. And then it turned into six episodes. <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess Castle Wolfenstein, the original, did a really great job in just how great the game was and inspired us to make this, which then inspired a lot of shooters and, and uh, everything that came after it. Um, right after we basically made this game, then we made Doom, uh, which is basically a you know better version of the Wolfenstein engine. That we we were tweaking the Wolfenstein engine and found that we couldn't use the same data structures to create a world that had you know walls at any angle and, and uh, heights and stuff. The data just wasn't there, so we had to basically throw away Wolfenstein's data structures and just create a whole new structure for the engine. Um, and, uh, and it was tough to get out of Wolfenstein design mode, so when we were making levels in Doom, we were making them like Wolfenstein levels. And we were just like, this is not the way to make this game. This does not look cool. This is like Wolfenstein, but with you know light and darkness in it. Um, so we had to spend a lot of time just figuring out what are we doing with these levels? Like, how do we make a world you know, that's, that's more interesting than the Wolfenstein one. And so we finally figured it out, and it was just like, we, get, we, we can't go realistic, it has to be abstract. Um, the, we tried the realistic approach, and it was boring. It was more fun to try and actually go through real military buildings that are square and there's offices and stuff, because it's not even cool. So, um, so we just went for a completely abstract design that used a lot of height and a lot of contrast, and, um, and that's basically what what we did when we made this game, and this one uh, took us a year to make from the beginning, and uh, and we knew that when we were making the game, it was going to be pretty awesome. 
uh, we even put out a press release when we started making the game saying how awesome it was. <laughs> and, you know, what was going in it. and I think that's the first time I've ever read, you know, a company saying we're making this game. It's going to be crazy awesome. It's going to be the, you know, we, we anticipate it to be the, the greatest decrease in productivity globally. Um, it says all the stuff in the press release. And, and basically, here's what the tech is going to do. We're going to have multiplayer and just here's a big list of challenges for us to do this year when we make the game. And we actually made almost everything on that list. Um, but it was kind of crazy to do that. But we, you know, we got multiplayer in there, so then we had Deathmatch, and then there's all the, the multiplayer stuff that, that's been happening since then. And then after that, um, uh, this game came out in 1993, and, uh, and then in, you know, 94 we did a sequel, did some other games like Heretic, um, and then in 95 we started working on next big game that was basically taking first person shooters into I guess more advanced te uh, territory with um, with full 3D so this is Quake and um, and this one uh, has full 3D you can see there's like rooms above rooms and ledges and lava and um, this game was kind of designed to be a, uh, a dark and disturbing violent game uh, versus Doom, which is, you know, it was like future uh, space marine versus hell demons, right? You know, it's like, it's cool, it's fine to kill demons, it's great to kill Nazis, nobody's going to get mad about any of those things. And then with Quake, it's like, well, let's kill crazy monsters in this one, you know. Um, so uh, so this one actually is, is uh, plain Doom is not too scary. It was when it first came out, but it's not too scary because over time it's yeah, pixelated and everything. But Quake is still a pretty scary game when you play it. Uh, if you play it with lights out, turn up the sound, and just try going through it. You know, it was made to be uh, violent and disturbing. Um, and uh, there was there was even one more part of the game where I wanted I wanted the whole game to kind of always be unsettling. So. Um, when you were just standing still, not doing anything, I wanted the screen to still kind of move around a little bit, so it's never still, like the world never stops. And uh, and we put that in there, and uh, we had a value that was a little too high when we put it in. And I just asked Adrian, "Hey, so what do you think about that?" And he's like, uh, "I get sick." So I was like, "Okay, I'll just turn it off." We were just trying to get the game done, but uh, but that code is still in there for whenever you finish a level and it's going to be an intermission and the camera's looking around. Then we just change the value, make it a little bit higher. And to see that that value is in there. But the game was supposed to always be unsettling and, and disturbing by never stopping. Um, but it turned out to be you know, a really fun game. Multiplayer was great. Um, uh, it basically spawned all of the esports games that are out. You know, people have, uh, have professional tournaments now playing games uh, like you know, deathmatch games or capture the flag or whatever. Um, and they still have that every year now. It's crazy. Prizes, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in prizes. Uh, this game spawned a, a convention called QuakeCon that started 19, I think it was 97, and has been going every year. So QuakeCon 90, QuakeCon 2012 is, is coming up in August, and they've had one every single year, and it's kind of like a mini E3 uh, just for shooters. So uh, it takes place in Dallas where Rib is at, and um, and so this game. Is you know there's only there's only like three really cons I guess in the gaming world there's there's Minecon for Minecraft because that game is crazy huge uh, there's uh, BlizzCon for Blizzard it's World of Warcraft and Starcraft and, uh, and you know, Warcraft three and then there's QuakeCon so those are three uh, three big things out there um, so I knew that. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of people that have stories about, I mean, everybody here has stories about the Apple II, uh, even if you started late in the late 90s or even later than that, getting into the Apple II, there's always a story about, you know, what what did the, what does this computer mean to you? What did it, what what is it about this computer that keeps you interested in it or thinking about it or always, you know, looking fondly back on it? And so um, I asked uh, several people from the Apple II world uh, back then, uh, to write something, just write a little paragraph for me to, to read to you guys. So um, you might not be able to read it on the screen, so I'll just read it. <laughs> I'll read it out loud here. Um, 
So Bill Budge, uh, he wrote, I, I bought my first Apple II computer when I was a PhD student at the University of California in Berkeley. I wanted to play with graphics and sound, something we couldn't do with the computers and mini computers that the university had at the time. I started by just playing with this amazing little machine. I typed in Waz's integer basic breakout game, which is a little breakout, and became quite good at it, eventually being able to hit the ball with such precision I could drill a hole through the rows of bricks and get the ball into the back row where it would clear out the rest of the blocks without me having to move the paddle. When I got tired of that, I tried to make the game more challenging by altering the code. That led to learning 6502 assembly language, to make it faster, and learning how to draw in high resolution graphics to make the board seem larger. Soon I was hooked. And instead of preparing for my exams, I was devoting all my time to programming games. I never got that PhD, but I'm incredibly <laughs> grateful the Apple II was my introduction to the world of my computers and games. I'm not sure if you guys knew that the reason why I was made the Apple II was so we could put breakout on it. That was, that was it. And he made breakout for Atari. Um, and, uh, and, he, and he wanted to have his own that he actually just write in basic a, a breakout game and not have to do an assembly or any shit and things like he did in Atari. So that was, little breakout was the reason why the Apple II was really good. <laughs> um, and it was such an inspiration that, you know, it got Bill Buds going. Um, so John Van Canningham, uh, he created a whole Mind Magic series, New World Computing, uh, you know, Heroes of Mind Magic, etc. Uh, he goes, Apple II changed my life. I first discovered this fantastic piece of technology while studying to be a doctor at UCLA. Immediately I was hooked. Playing games and learning how to program became my addiction. I decided to switch directions to computer science and convince myself that I could create games for a living. This amazing machine was my canvas and paint that allowed me to express myself in ways I could have never imagined. To this day, I think about new game designs and ways to use devices and allow people to be creative and have fun. It all started with my Apple II. My magic here. You, you. <laughs> yeah. I actually did the My Magic 2 port for the Apple II or Apple II. So, um, that was, I actually did that for um, New World Computing, but I never actually contacted John back then. So you could see my game. I just kept on sending him the updates. Um, I didn't actually meet him for 10 years later <laughs> until 10 years later when he got to tell him, Yeah, I remember that. And he's just like, Yeah, we couldn't believe him. We were getting in his email address. Um, so Will Wright, uh, you know, the guy who made The Sims and all the Sim games and Spore, etc. Um, I got my first computer, an Apple II Plus, in 1980. I was building robotic contraptions at the time, and a friend talked me into it. I'd taken some college, a programming in college, key punch cards, Fortran, and found it mildly interesting, but now in front of me I had a complete computer that I could program and get instant feedback on a graphic display. Within weeks, I was hooked on it. I dropped all my robotic projects and immersed myself in learning this amazing machine. Within a few months, I was researching AI, simulations, and all sorts of other stuff. As a kid, I loved building models of things, planes, tanks, and ships. That's what led to my interest in robotics. But now, I realize that in this Apple II, I've found the ultimate modeling medium, one in which I can finally build dynamic and interactive models of the world. And uh, his first game was called Raid on Bungling Bay. Uh, published by Rotobind, of course. Um, and that game was published, he made that game on, uh, or published on the Commodore 64, uh, but he wrote it on the Apple II. And so he cross-developed that game because the Commodore 64's keyboard was just awful. It had 40 characters crossed, you know. He wanted he wanted to have the, an Apple II, and he did that in uh, 84. So he was doing cross-development uh, between the Apple and the Commodore. And his first Commodore game was actually really an Apple II game. The same, uh, you know, same instruction set and everything. So he did the whole thing on the Apple II. <laughs> um, and it's funny, I did a, a I did a, an interview with Will a year ago on stage at, a, at an event and about his his career. And everybody knows the game designs and all the industry. Everybody knows the games that he designed and everything. But I had no idea. I couldn't read any nowhere could I read or find out if he actually coded at all. Like, did he program? I know he designed stuff, but if you can code, this whole interview is going in a different direction. And so I talked to him just beforehand. He's like, oh, yeah, 602 assembly language all over the place on the Apple II. I was like, no. <laughs> great. So it was a really great interview <laughs> about 602 stuff with him on stage. Um, so Jordan Mechner, I interviewed him or asked him. Uh, he says, I was a sophomore in high school when I bought my first Apple II at 16K and it cost 1200 my life savings. 
I remember opening the box, the tactile thrill of lifting the computer out of those custom molded foam packing pieces. I knew it was going to change my life, and it did. For the first time, I had a computer at home that was all mine. Not only could I play games on it as much as I wanted, I could program whenever I wanted. After school, and instead of school, I progressed from typing and programming lessons from the Red Book to inventing my own games. Over the next five years, I wrote dozens of games, all unpublished, until in 1984 my dream came true. My game, Karateka, <laughs> was accepted for publication by Broderman Software. And what had been my passion and hobby became my career. In all, I spent 10 years programming the Apple II before Prince of Persia shipped in 1989. And I finally moved on to more powerful development systems. I've never felt the same sentimental attachment to any of them. Um, and it's funny, I felt exactly the same way that he did. We got our first Apple II in 1981, and I think I was, um, I got it before I started high school, so I was like, just got out of eighth grade, I think. And uh, I remember getting the computer out of the box, and I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to even touch the box. Like, it was gonna get sent to the house, and like, don't touch it, Dad's coming home. And, you know, I couldn't wait to get this thing set up, and my mom was just like, don't get mad at him. <laughs> He couldn't wait, <laughs> and I had the computer all set up and everything because I had already used it at the local college, um, and I'd been going to the computer store after school all the time trying to get time on the machine, so I finally had one. I felt the same way that, that Jordan did where you have the machine at home now. There's no reason to go out you know, <laughs> to look at other computers or to do anything else. Right? <laughs> so it was all about working on the computer and being able to program anything, and that was like, I was doing that in 81 on, in basic, and uh, I was, and, and it's funny, this funny story about, uh, I wanted to learn assembly language really, really bad. I was only 13, I think, 13 or 14, and um, the Apple II reference manual has everything that you could ever need to know about the computer in it. Like, everything is in there, even the, even the hardware diagrams. I couldn't understand it, though. I can understand the basic stuff, but as soon as it turned into machine language and assembly, I'm like, I don't know what it means, and I want to really bad. Um, I asked my friend, you know, I was programming in basic, and we went to the, the computer store nearby, and I said, I want to learn how to make games like this fast. Basic can't do this. And he said, oh, I'll show you what it looks like. And he just beep, breaks, you know, breaks in the monitor, and he, and he didn't do an assembly language dump. He just dumped memory, 16 bytes across, right? A big block of hex on the screen, and he's like, that's the game. That was running back right then. We just reset out of the game in the store. He's like, that's what the game was written in. I'm like, no way. Seriously? I program in numbers? Like, what, is <laughs> what are these numbers? I don't even know what this is. 5B? What? You know, so it made no sense to me. And it was like a wall of no. You know, it's not going to happen. But, but it was like, no, I have to. If I'm going to make these games, I need to understand what that stuff is. And now I can look at a big block of hex and say, that's a JSR, you know, this address, and an RTS and all this and just recognize the opcodes. But back then it was just like unintelligible garbage. And so my parents got me a book uh, called Programming the 6502 by Rodney Zacks. Yeah. Now, uh, that was like the worst thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why is because that book uh, had no code in it to type in. It was all the the way that the 6502 works, the, the ALU and CPU and how all the buses work and the logic units and IO and all this stuff that had nothing to type into an Apple II. It was the first, you know, he founded Cybex, the book company, um, with this book. And uh, and I thought that this was gonna be the, the magic secret that I needed and, and it had nothing in it that I could type. I'm like, where do I type the code into the Apple? It had nothing, it didn't even care about apples. It was just about 6502. So there was nothing machine specific, which, you know, if you're programming on a uh, Atari 2600, the whole zero page thing is completely different than an Apple II. And, and, you know, you can't, you can't even program the same way. So, um, so anyway, that book was so useless to me, and, and, it was, and I, I almost had no books and magazines back then, so it was like, I got this rare opportunity to have a book, it's useless to me, you know, until finally in December of 82, um, I finally got her, she got me assembly lines, the book. And uh, Jeffrey Andy yeah, by Roger Wagner and then Jeffrey Stanton's uh, Apple II Graphics and Arcade Games Daniel. Um, and so I had those two those two books and I had Bag of Tricks as well, which I didn't really like whatever packing stuff that was more interested in programming. And so as soon as I opened up programming the, the, the assembly lines, it was like one page. I get it. Like one page, one two page. Uh, there it is. That's all I need to know. You know, type in the Apple, it runs. Oh my God. 
year, you know, plus year and a half, just wasted in basic. I couldn't learn the stuff. And the worst part of it was that this was in December. I got it for Christmas. And in the first uh, week of January, we're moving to England, and the Apple and everything's going on a boat. <laughs> so I just got the key to knowledge from this, you know, except for <laughs> And I got a, a book on how to program bitmap graphics and everything. And then I can't type it in to a computer because we're moving to England. So I basically had to write all my games on paper uh, and hand assemble all the assembly language with the you know, complete reference manual and hand, hand assemble all that stuff. And then when I went to school uh, during lunchtime, I could type in the, the machine code into the computer, you know. And again, of course, because if you're writing machine code, you can't you can't just type just continue. You have to leave blocks of nots and stuff. No options actually put extra stuff in there. So I had to do all those crazy patch patches of code in memory, different places, calling each other, mm -hmm. because I didn't have an assembler. They you know, all everything was to, didn't have a computer. So I had to start writing my first games on paper, and I still have all of the paper that, that I've ever written games on. So everything I've written since '81, I have all of the disks and everything. So, um, but I still have all the paper, and then finally the computer comes, and I'm typing in crazy amounts of machine learning games. Like immediately, I'm just like, "Here's okay, that runs. <laughs> yeah, all right, next." You know, and it's just like slamming out. In 1983, I made so many games, I published them like four years later. I just like pounded out, I don't know, probably 15 games. Something like that, and they sold probably like eight or ten of them. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was it was a super crazy addiction. Um, one of the interesting, one of the fun things uh, that happened before we went to England was uh, because we're moving, we don't know how many years we're going to be over there. We decided to go take a trip to Tucson. We were living in, in near Sacramento, and we're going to go back to Tucson where our whole family is on both sides. Basically, say goodbye to everybody, and meet, you know, say hi, and goodbye. We're gonna be off for a few years. We won't be here next summer for barbecues and stuff. And so, um, on the way down, my parents surprised me by taking me to Beagle Brothers, which was super <laughs> awesome. So, I, you know, uh, we went down through Sac uh, San Diego, which was not in, you know, that was out of the way. We were going down five to, to ten and everything. Going down, you know, to eight was. <laughs> Was really out of the way, but they knew that I was a huge, huge, huge Beagle Brothers fan. I had, you know, everything that mm -hmm. that that uh, that had been made from Beagle Brothers, except it was, you know, pirated stuff. And I had <laughs> copies of all the manuals and everything, and um, and it was pretty cool. Uh, I was, I think, on that trip, I had a basic listing for a game that I wrote called Alien Attack Two, and it was a basic. And I was basically laying in the back of the station wagon, and and just like annotating it and just kind of trying to come up with better ideas and debug and stuff. And then finally we pull up in, you know, in front of Bert's house. And uh, and and there's like, all right, we're here. I'm like, uh, where, where are we at? And they're like, we're at Beagle Brothers. And so I was like, no way. Seriously? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I was only like 13. And so um, 13 or 14. And so we go up to the front door. And, you know, he's he had a like a Victorian style house. and. Um, the, the wood on the on the front porch went went uh, you know horizontally this way, but right in front of the door, going vertically was a square of wood going the other way, and the doorbell said ring once for trap door, twice for doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> so you could tell like that's Bert Kersey right there. It's totally hilarious. So you know we were doing really fast, and, and we go inside, and he's got you know tables with pants and roller skate legs and. Just all kinds of crazy stuff in there, and upstairs is where Beagle Brothers was. So, if you like go up the stairs, there's the giant logo of Beagle Brothers framed up on the wall as you go up and then up back this way. And Sophie was there, so the dog was was still alive there. Um, and went upstairs, and he was in the middle of writing Beagle Menu when I got there. And um, he's just like, "Yeah, Jack Cassidy pretty much writes this for the year," and you know, he helps with DOS box and stuff. Um, and so it was really great to get to talk to him about all the stuff that he'd written because it was so it was it was uh, so great that he you know that's that's I, I think Bert uh, Bert was the the person who kind of instilled the whole open source thing in me and Karma to basically let our code be out there and free for people to learn from. Um, I did a lot of that you know in Nibble Magazine publishing my listings and kind of table listings of my games and stuff, and uh, and that was 
own spirit of, of also like teaching people how to do stuff. Um, you know, here's how you make a game in assembly language, and here's what these instructions mean and stuff. And so, you know, that's what Bert was doing with all of his crazy, you know, tips and tricks. Um, <laughs> actually, had a couple of mine printed in this big fit book that came out. Um, and uh, and so he was he was all about just openness, nothing that's pirated. You know, you go ahead and copy it if you really want to, but you shouldn't. <laughs> Um, and so he was, he was like, for us, the original open source guy. And so we just kind of followed in his, his footsteps when we released the source to all of our, our games kind of a little later. Um, but it was really great meeting him. I was just shaking the whole time because I couldn't believe it. I found out that uh, all of the art that, the, that was in all the Beagle Brothers, everything, he drew himself. So he was, a, he was, a, he was an artist. And he, he, all those old Victorian wood catch looking stuff, he actually drew all of them. Like he professionally used to do that before he got into programming. And so, uh, so he did all that stuff himself. And, and uh, in the 1980s Super Bowl, the LED readouts and stuff, he programmed all that on the Apple II. Uh, so he programmed that in 1980 Super Bowl LED stuff that went on constantly during the show on his Apple II. Um, and uh, so he was totally, totally cool. Um, but uh, but anyway, I, you know, I learned I learned my assembly language the hard way, I guess. <laughs> and then you know, finally got Merlin and got to type on the computer and, and save everything. Um, let's see. Uh, Richard Garriott. Richard writes the importance of the Apple II in my early career was that the machine was the perfect level of complexity for one person to wholly master. In my case. This allowed me to know every byte of memory, every I.O. port, how to modulate a one-bit speaker to make saucy sound forms, give rise to deep understanding of binary text in each and every command within the processor, every byte of the ROM, each subroutine of DOS. The result of this is that it gave me a wide range and understanding of the technical trade-offs between design goals, part needs, audio needs, text storage, and frame rate in each and every discipline that makes a game work. You today get such a wide ranging level of expertise that the base is so complex that specialization begins early in the industry to react. The result is that while every artist I've ever hired is better than is better than I ever was, and while I was a decent programmer, again I have been humbled by the technical skills of those who have come since. In the area of design production, where someone has to make the judgment call to which specialty will gain favor over the machine's limited resources, I have an intuitive understanding that helps guide my decisions. And I still feel that my design skills rank at the top of the heap, not because I'm innately more creative, but because of the journey I've been on starting with the Apple II. Thanks, PCC. Richard Gary just raised like seven million for his company, Portal RM, last week, um, which is making Facebook games. Uh, so he's still, he did his little space thing, and he came back to Earth and got back in. Got back into continuing to make games. So Richard Gary is still making games. Jordan Mechner is making movies now. Um, uh, he's he did a, a documentary just recently um, about uh, I think Dodger Stadium or something. Uh, that's a really great documentary. You can look at, just look up Jordan Mecker and you'll see. Um, I can't remember the name of the documentary, but it was really really good. Uh, he just did it. So he's like a filmmaker guy now. <laughs> um, and. Uh, I think of Soft Talk never happened. Uh, so Soft Talk magazine uh, was, uh, to me, the best computer magazine that's ever existed. And I've read all of them. I've read all the old Byte magazines in the 70s, uh, Creative Computing, the specialist ones, compute, you know, Compute and, and Antic and all that stuff. And Soft Talk just had, it just embodied the spirit of the Apple II almost perfectly. Um, in the sense of community that, that Margot and Al Tomrovic um, had had instilled in everybody, uh, they were it, they they approached uh, the the, the um, I guess the Apple II community as normal people, not as super techie programmer types. So um, they had lots of you know guess who's going to win the Super Bowl contest, who's going to win the Emmy you know the Academy Awards, and just all these little Oracle contests. Um, they had. Uh, you know, leaders in the industry writing articles, uh, like um, I guess Bert Kersey was writing DOS Talk before Tom took it over. Um, Doug Carlson wrote all about AppleSoft. Bill Budge did the graphics page. You know, just kind of went on and on. Lots of these. Yeah, Assembly Lines, Roger. I mean, like all these people were writing these were super important columns back then. Um, I remember um, 
you know, I've, I actually have like a pristine copy of the entire soft talk from the first to the last um, that, that I got from Margo. And uh, I got that at the Apple II party because they had two, they had, they had I think, um, three copies. They had one of their own that was all dog-eared and everything because they'd been looking stuff up. And then they had one that was going to the Smithsonian and then I bought the other one. And so, <laughs> so I have like the entire in perfect condition collection of all the soft talk magazines because it was just like the most amazing, you know, it was a magazine that was out. There was non, you know, there was stories in there. Of course, there was the top 30 lists and top fives of every category. Um, you know, and the whole industry, like if you, if you want to look back at stats in the industry, those are really the only stats that exist now back in the early, and then no one was keeping track of this stuff except for them. So if you go back to 1980, what were what was selling the best? Um, you know that was before the soft sell lists and the soft cat lists and stuff that only real distributors get. That's kind of hidden data, like uh, the NPD stuff nowadays. Um, but back then, it was in every issue. So um, they uh, they were um, in the app in the in the Apple II industry. Uh, everybody called Margo the glue, uh, and Soft Talk was the glue to the whole the whole industry. Um, so, um, and I didn't know that, I was just reading the magazines and just thought they were the best thing ever. And uh, they had, you know, the interviews, exec, you know, serious or exec uh, flooring company or whatever. Um, and, uh, and just had just lots of, everything was, in, was interesting there. So I had Margo write, write something. So she wrote like a two pager here. <laughs> uh, the Apple II Plus we bought in 1979 came with a handful of cassette tapes. The store in Burbank, one of three computer stores in all of Los Angeles, expected their first disk drives to arrive in a couple weeks. When they arrived on time, we moved from brick out, little brick out, to the wonder of Beneath Apple Manor, a true dungeon adventure game. Wilderness Campaign wasn't far behind an adventure involving managing resources. By the time we'd made Soft Talk, Games were abounding. Every month there was some exciting breakthrough. Colorful low res blocks gave way to black and white high res cows and dungeons. Text adventures gained vocabulary and greater interaction. Ken Williams created the high res white line drawn pictures on black screen adventure mystery house and a few months later figured out how to fill in the color and color high res was born. Serious software was not too long after we learned how to move through scenery seemingly seamlessly instead of jumping from one scene to another. All of this happened with no change in the hardware. At some point, a card came out that could up your 48K Apple to 64K, but that was it. Everything else was software. And the absolute leaders in software progress were gamers. Productivity software, educational software, word processors, accounting programs, all that um, serious stuff. Learn slowly and sometimes reluctantly from the game makers. <laughs> games were the leaders of progress, and the games were more amazing with every turn. Another advance, perhaps even more amazing and important, was what some of these games brought out in the folks that played them. Consider the very early but sophisticated wizardry. The playing field consisted of numerous levels of a dungeon made of high res white lines on black. At the bottom of the screen were the names of six characters whom you never saw. Yet players became adept at sweeping through these large, complex, visually nearly featureless dungeons swiftly and confidently, even at the point of being able to discuss dungeon trips with other players and everyone understood. A few years later, another breakthrough game from Mike Berlin and Infocom, Suspended, provided the ability to have six characters who would travel not in a group but independently so the player could have his characters accomplish different tasks virtually simultaneously. And on and on it went in a fantastic avalanche of joyful wonder for years. A time of wonder that has not been repeated, but the colors enhances everything we enjoy on our Macs and iPads and iPhones today. And she lives like an hour and a half from me. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do a big interview with her, but she, you know, she was, they were there watching it and writing about it. And, um, and so she also, like the, uh, everybody else looks back on the Apple II, it was a really great time in their life. And, um, and I've been through several, um, you know, several, I mean, I've been through the whole game industry since, since really since it started. And that, you know, the, the time of the arcades and the time of the Apple II, there's really not been anything like that. Um, I think that during the time that multiplayer games started and, and LAN parties and stuff like that, that was another really, really fun time, but it was different than, 
it was different than, than what was written in the Apple II. Um, and that's, that's it. These are the original rock stars. <laughs> if you remember, Trip Hawkins was, was you know, marketing game programmers as rock stars back then. And, and even these guys didn't really feel like they were rock stars. They knew it was kind of a marketing kind of thing. But uh, looking back today, they really were rock stars. You know, these guys created the future that, that we're all playing today. Um, that's it. And so after this one, <laughs> I'm scheduled for another one, which is really just talking about all kinds of random stuff, and, and I think I'll just a ton of Q Q and A kind of stuff. But there's like. We'll take a break for about a half hour or something like that. Right. What about <coughs> any Q and A that was submitted during this session? You want to address that during the next yeah, one? Or? I can do Q and A right now. If you guys will have any questions about this, yeah. Why don't I uh, read you the ones that were submitted? Okay. Ken, why don't we have a <laughs> stretch? Stretch our legs. And stuff. You want to break first? Just stretch our legs yeah. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I will remember it all. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a break. Um, but first, the first. Our key, uh, the chair of our campus Fest committee would like to say or do something. Recap on your, uh, on your recap of what the Apple II brought to you and how it got you started. Okay. And uh, so that it will always be forevermore with you, we'd like to give you the first Apple II Forever Award from oh, yeah. campus Fest 2002. Oh, awesome. Yay. Can you name them all? Uh, well, there's Dangerous Dave in, in uh, Major Mayhem, and I think that might be Jumpster there. Is that, are there more than that? There's Peter Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> there's Who the actually made it. And, oh. And the spaceship of Yeah, 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 that, 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 down on the bottom right. These are on the, the shirts, right? Yeah. Shirts. Yeah. yeah, that's, uh, actually that game was called Twilight Treasures when I wrote it, and then I sent it. To actually, I've been you remember Nibble magazine, so I write to Mark Mike Harvey every once in a while now, and uh, he's been selling the old Nibble stuff, and, and so he totally remembers because I sent him so much stuff like that. Um, but he renamed it to Treasure Dive, and that kind of screwed up my whole alliter alliteration <laughs> series because I I made almost the whole alphabet of games alliterative, like Alien Tech, City Centurion, Major Mayhem, Lethal Labyrinth. Object, you know, Operation Obliteration and Twilight Treasures was the T one, and they changed it to Treasure Dive. <laughs> <laughs>